All right, guys, uh, let's get started. Again, round of applause for DD Drop Tables. Keep it down. Um, how, are, how are you? Things are okay? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> okay, awesome. All right, before we get started, I want to go through uh, some comments and feedback we've had on the course on the most uh, urbane of all of the uh, places we could get feedback about the course, and that's YouTube. Um, so here's some of the comments we've gotten so far on, on YouTube. And it's this sort of standard stuff, right? Andy's the worst professor. I don't learn anything about databases. That's OK. Uh, he wants to hope I get cancer soon. Um, this guy says, he, all my friends go to CMU. They say this professor has the worst hygiene anybody on school. He smells like uh, old boiled eggs. So that is true. I did, I did used to have a hygiene problem. And now I use like a special shampoo. But if it's overpowering, if it's still an issue, let me know. Um, and then we got feedback about you, right? Yo, DJ Drop Tables beats are so fresh that I had to take my shirt off. I'm not sure what that means. Uh, and they want us to feature you more. So it's normally this kind of crap. Um, but there is actually one mistake I made last class that people correctly pointed out. And he, when we were talking about hash functions, I asked, he, he, he named uh, SHA-256, and I think he named MD5. And I incorrectly said that SHA-256 is not, a, uh, it's not uh, asymmetrical, meaning you can't reverse it. Um, and then this guy says, take down the whole video, but whatever. Um, but my point still stands, right? So SHA-256 has cryptographic pr properties that we don't care about when we're doing our, in our hash tables. So we would never actually use that. The XXX hash or the city hash, farm hash stuff that we talked about before, that's the kind of hash functions we don't want to use. So in theory, you could still use SHA-256. Uh, it's not reversible, but nobody does that because it'd be too slow. OK? All right, so the other things that, again, just a reminder for everyone what's on the docket. So next week, on Friday, uh, project one should be done. Uh, that's due at midnight. So a bunch of people have already finished. Um, but again, post on Piazza if you have questions as you go along. And we've been updating uh, slightly. Uh, there's you know, pinned posts that provide clarifications on Piazza that help guide you along to uh, if you have questions about uh, different aspects of it. And then homework two we released on Monday uh, this week. And that'll be due uh, the following Monday after, after the, um, the, the first project is due. OK? So any high-level questions about project one? Who here has not tried to get it running on their local machine or their development environment? Everyone's at least tried that, OK? Good, awesome, OK. All right, so recall from last class, we started talking about different kind of data structures we could have inside of our database system. And we spent the entire lecture talking about hash tables. And we talked about how hash table or data structures in general, but especially hash tables, can be used in a variety of places inside the database system, like using it for internal metadata, actually storing the underlying tables uh, in our database, and also temporary data structures, like you know, building a hash table to, to, to do a join. So for the first three uh, uses of, ha of data structures, for a lot of these cases, the, the hash table is going to be good enough. Right? For, think of like internal of the system. It's not very often you're going to need to be able to do range queries. Most of the time, you want to say, go give me a single key, and give me, you know, for a given key, give me the value. And you're doing point query lookups. So the thing we want to talk about now, though, is table indexes. And this is where we, we may want to actually run queries that want to do range scans. And therefore, hash tables are going to be insufficient for us because, uh, you, know, because you can only do single key lookups. So everyone here should be roughly aware of what a table index is, but I just want to provide sort of a more formal definition so that we have a basic understanding go going throughout the rest of the lecture uh, what we're talking about. So a table index is a, essentially a replica of some subset of attributes in our tables and that we're storing in a more efficient manner that allows us to do efficient lookups to find the thing that we're looking for. So it, you know, in the worst case scenario, if we want to find a particular key in our table, we just do a sequential scan for that. But the idea of putting it into a table index, we would have some of this auxiliary data structure that we can traverse or do a lookup into and find exactly what we want more quickly than, than having to do a, a sequential scan. So the key thing to point out here is that the, the index is going to be a replica of the table. So that means that it has to be synchronized with the table. Meaning if we modify a tuple in our table, we want that change to be reflected in our, in our index. Because we don't want any false negatives or false positives. We don't want to add something to our table, not put it in our index, and then we do a lookup to find that, that, that tuple, and it's not in our index, and come back with a, with a negative result. Right? So the database system is what's is, is going to be responsible for maintaining uh, these indexes and keeping them completely synchronized with the, 
with, with, the, um, with the underlying table. And this is completely transparent to you as, as the application programmer. I don't know when I insert, I don't have to say, oh, insert in this table and oh, by the way, update these other indexes. The database system, at least at a SQL database system, would see the insert query and know that not only do I need to update the table, I also have to update any indexes I have on that table. So there's this trade-off now in our system between having lots of indexes make queries go faster and then the cost of maintaining them. And we'll see this as we go along today, and we saw this actually with hash tables last time, right? Inserting something into a, to an index sometimes will be really fast and sometimes could be really expensive depending on whether, you know, wherever we want, we want to insert a given key, there's something already there or not. So again, when we have a query show up, the database system is, is, is responsible for figuring out what's the most efficient access method for me to use, for the system to use, to answer the result of your query. And again, this is transparent to use the application programmer. I just write my select statement. I don't specify normally, in some cases you can, I don't specify normally exactly what index I want to use, the database system can, can, can figure that out for me. And again, going back to the very first lecture, this is one of the, the, the benefits or the advantages of the relational model and a declarative language like SQL. If I now, in my table, I, add, I write a bunch of queries in my application, and then later on I decide to add the index, I don't have to go back and rewrite my SQL to now use that index. The database system can figure that automatically for me, in theory. Uh, it doesn't always get it right. So this particular, uh, uh, step of actually taking a query and figuring out what indexes to use, this falls under the umbrella of query optimization, which is a super hard problem. We'll cover this in after the midterm. Um, but this sort of thing, it's like an optimization problem to decide, you know, what's the best way to execute a given query amongst all these different choices I have. So we'll cover that later on in the semester, but for now, we'll just assume that we, we know what index we want to pick when we do lookups. So, of course, there's now, as, as in always in, in computer science and databases, there's this trade-off between doing one thing a lot versus doing not at all. So if you have a lot of indexes, that'll make your queries certainly go faster to do lookups on them. But now you have this additional cost of having to store those indexes and actually maintain them. Right, so again, indexes are going to take up pages. We're going to store that in our buffer pool. We'll have to write that out to disk. So that takes up space. But then now, as I said, when I do updates to my tables, I have to go then also update my, all my indexes to reflect those changes. So if my table has a thousand indexes, which would, you know, in practice people do that kind of stuff, if I now do an insert, I have to do a thousand updates to all those indexes. And my update operation or insert operation isn't considered done until I've modified all my indexes because they have to be always synchronized. So again, we're not really going to discuss how you decide what indexes to pick, but this is another hard problem in databases as well. Right? They have tools to do uh, recommendations for you to decide what indexes you want to pick, or you pay a lot of money for human DBAs to, to do this for you. All right, so the things we're talking about today is just an overview of what a B plus tree is, um, and then we'll do uh, we'll spend some time to, to discussing like you know what are the uh, the implementation details we have to be concerned of when we build out our, our index, and then we'll finish up talking about uh, some additional optimizations that real systems actually do to actually make this thing be useful in practice. Okay? So the first thing we need, we need to address is this, this, what is a B plus tree and how does that relate to a B tree? So this is sort of the, the, the downside in databases is that a lot of times the same word is used to re reflect different things. And it can be quite confusing for someone getting, trying to get started to understand what's the actual difference between these things. So first of all, there's sort of this class of data structures called B trees. And then within that, there is a specific data structure that is a B tree. So oftentimes people use the B plus tree and B tree interchangeably. Um, but if you go back to the literature back in the 1970s, these were actually distinct data structures. And Wikipedia has them as d distinct data structures today. So the first B tree came out in 1971. Um, the, then the B tree, B plus tree came out two years later in 1973. There's no paper that describes what the B plus tree is. Uh, there's a 1979 survey paper that says, here's all the, you know, the, the B, B, tr B plus tree or B trees that are out there. And oh, by the way, IBM invented the B plus tree in 1973. And supposedly there's a tech report that says, describes this, but, uh, you can't easily find it on the internet. And then during the 70s and 80s, there's a bunch of these other ones that are variants on this. The B star tree is, is, is a variant on the B tree. And then actually the B link tree is, came out in 1981. 
And actually, this was invented here at CMU. Uh, this is the paper that, that describes it. So this was written by Phil Lehman. That dude still works here. He's in the dean's office. Uh, so if you, if you love this lecture, you can go talk to him. He loves, every time I see him, I always say, like, oh, we, we discussed the Beeling tree in my class. And he's like, oh, that paper's so f***ed, right? So 40 years later, it's, it's still around. So the reason why I showed these, these, other, these other trees is because we're going to focus on the B plus tree, but we're not going to, in, in a modern system, we're not going to use it exactly the way it's described in like the 1970s. We're actually going to borrow bits and pieces from all these other trees that have existed before, but now we're just going to call that the B plus tree. And again, a lot of times you'll see in, in database systems, they'll say we're using a B tree. I can almost guarantee you, or at least I've yet to see one uh, a system where they say they're using a, a B tree and it's not really actually a B plus tree. Like if you go look at the Postgres source code, or Postgres documentation, they talk about using a B tree, but from, from the, as much as I can tell looking at, at what it's actually doing, it's really a B plus tree. So again, these words are used inter interchangeably. I'll try to say always B plus tree. I'll briefly mention what a B tree is later on, but in practice, this is what we care about. This is what we want to use in our system. Okay, so a B plus tree is a self-balancing tree data structure. So the B in, 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 in B plus tree or B tree means balanced. And the idea is that it's going to keep data we insert into our, uh, or into our data structures in sorted order. And that's going to allow us to do efficient uh, searches, sequential scans along the leaf nodes, assertions, and deletions. And we can do all of this in, in log n. Again, contrasting this with the hash table, the hash table in the best case scenario was O1. Uh, worst case scenario was ON. In a B plus tree, because it's balanced, it's always going to be log n. And that means essentially no matter the, the distance from the root to any, any key in a leaf node is always log n. No matter how many times we delete and insert and change things around. So the B plus tree came out in the 1970s because they were trying to build a data structure that would make it efficient to do you know, uh, index lookups on, uh, on hardware where the disk was super slow and memory, memory was limit, limited. So the B plus tree has this nice advantage of, compared to like a B tree, is that you can just scan along the leaf nodes after you traverse to the bottom, and you'll read everything in sequential order, or sequ do, doing sequential scan along them. You don't never have to go back up, in general. Um, the, again, even though this was designed in the, the 1970s, it's still widely used today. And actually, even for faster disks and for in-memory databases where there is no disk, the B plus tree actually outperforms a lot of things. And it's still very, very useful. So this is the original paper. Uh, this is one that everyone cites, the, the ubiquitous B tree uh, from 1979. And it's here in this paper they describe, or they mention that, oh, yeah, there's this thing called the B plus tree from IBM, and it came out in 1973. And this is what normally people cite uh, when, when, when you want to cite a paper for, for the B plus tree. So what are the properties we're going to have in a B plus tree? So it's considered an M-way search tree, meaning we can, within every node in our, in our, in our tree, it can have M different paths to, uh, to other nodes, or up to M paths, not always exactly M. Again, it's perfectly balanced. We're going to main, the, the, the data structure maintains the balance over time as, as, you, as you modify the tree. And so and by balance, I mean that again, the, the distance from one leaf node or any leaf node to the root is always going to be log N. It's always going to be the same. The other thing is we have to do is that we have to maintain this, this guarantee that the, each node is at least half full. So again, if I, for the number of keys I can have in my node, I have to have more than half minus one, half the number of paths in my, in my tree, and then I have to have less than n minus one. So n minus one would be a completely full node. So I always have to be at least half full. And then we'll see this when we start doing deletes. If I'm not, then I have to start moving data around so that my node is half full. And again, that's how they're going to guarantee this first one, that the distance is always, always the same. And then the simple one is that every, every inner node, which I'll describe in the next slide, if you have k keys in, stored in your node, again, you can have up to n minus 1. If you have k keys, you're going to have k plus 1 non-null children. You have k pass or pointers to, k plus 1 pass or pointers to, to children below. Actually, a quick sh show of hands, who here has seen a B plus tree before? Very few. Good. Okay, good. Again, this is the best data structure for databases, so this is why you're here. All right, so this is the basic B plus tree. All right, and the layout is that, again, along the bottom, we have our leaf nodes. 
and then any node that's not a leaf node is considered an inner node. Now this tree has a height of two, meaning it has two levels, so the inner node is, is also the root node. Right? There's always going to be one node at the top because that's how you enter in, into the tree. <coughs> and then down here in the, in the leaf nodes, we're actually going to have sibling pointers. So this is something that came from the B-link tree. So at, any inner node won't have sibling pointers, but any leaf node will. So now I can traverse to the bottom and scan along and, you know, in any direction that I want to keep finding my, my neighbors, get more, getting more data. <coughs> so in the inner nodes, uh, it's going to be this, this, this combination of keys and pointers. And so for the inner nodes, the pointer is always going to be to another node or null if there's nothing there. And then the key is just the, the whatever attributes we, we're, we're building our index on, whatever we're trying to store in this. And then these keys are then used to determine which path you should go down as you start doing a search for a given key. So in this case here, for this first key, five. So the path to the left of it going this direction will be for any value, any keys that are less than five. And then for the, the one that comes after it would be implicitly anything less than nine or greater than five. So if I'm looking for something, a value, a key that's less than five, I would look at this and say, well, I'm looking for key one. One is less than five. So I go down this path and now I find my leaf node and I, and I, and I try to you know, find the thing that I'm looking for. The leaf nodes, the, the, the key value pairs are just, again, just the key the same way they are up above in the inner nodes, but then the value can, can differ. We'll see this in a second. It could either be a record ID to a tuple. It could be uh, the actual tuple itself. It, it doesn't matter. It's just that the inner nodes have pointers. The leaf nodes have, have data. So again, this is just to repeat what I just said. But then the, the way to think about it in each node, it's, a, uh, it's an array of key value pairs. And you're using the keys to determine whether it's the, if you're in the leaf node, whether it's the thing you want, or if you're inner node, whether you, you go left or right. So in general, but not, not always, the keys are always in each node are always sorted in whatever the, the, the sorting order you want, the correlation you want for that node, right? So my example here, we just sorted, you know, in, in, in numerical order. And so that's going to allow us when we jump into a node, potentially, if, depending how it's implemented, we can do binary search in each node and try to find the thing that we're looking for, rather than just having to do a linear search. But sometimes linear search is good too. So the contents of, again, of what these values are in the leaf nodes can vary depending on the database system. Again, it could be record IDs, it could be, it could be the actual tuples themselves, and we'll see some examples in a second. All right, so let's actually look to see how these this leaf nodes are actually implemented. So again, logically, you just sort of think of it like this, that you have this, 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 this array, and you alternate with key value pairs. And this is typically how a lot of textbooks show what a B plus tree node looks like. And so the first thing to point is, this, since this is the leaf node, we have pointers at the end, the end and the beginning of our array to our siblings, right? And this would be a node ID or page ID to allow us to go in either direction. Or if we're at the right side of the tree or the left side of the tree, it would just be null. But again, nobody actually stores, no real database system would store their, uh, their, their inner, internal, internal key value arrays for a B plus tree leaf node like this. Uh, and these are just key value pairs and these are just pointers. Typically, it's stored separately. So just like in our slot of pages, we would have a header that tells us some metadata about what our, what's in our page. So in this case here, we can say what level in the tree we are, essentially how many steps away from the, from the root we are, how many free slots that we have remaining in, in, our, in our node, and then the, the previous and next person. And then now you see that we separated out the, the keys and the values. Let me take a guess why you'd want to do something like this. Yes. That the whole B plus tree index can fix, uh, fit in one page, and then like that values can be in some other pages. He said so that for a given page on a B plus tree node, that all the keys can fit in one page, and then the values can fit in another page. No, the the keys and values are typically always stored in the same page. Yes. Because they are not of the same size. Exactly. So they're not of the same size, right? Furthermore, also too, when you, if you're doing binary search on this. You want everything to fit in, in your CPU caches. So if you have, if you're back here with all this intermixed, in order to do binary search, I actually don't need the values at this point because I'm just trying to find the key that I want. So if you break it up, right, depending whether it's fixed length or, or, or variable length, you can jump through the keys much more efficiently. The values typically are always fixed length, right? Because they're either like, you know, 32 bit or 64 bit record IDs. If they're, they're tuple, that's a little more complicated. 
But in general, you, you always want to separate them. Right? And again, the way it works is just whatever offset you are in, in the key array corresponds to some offset in the, in the value array. So if I find a key I'm looking for, I'm going to offset 4, then I know just to jump to offset 4 in the value array, and that finds the thing that I, that I want. So as I already said, the, the values can vary depending on the system. Some systems will destroy the record ID. This is probably the most common implementation that people use. This is what Postgres does. Uh, this is what all the other you know, commercial database systems do. What's more uh, complicated, and we can talk about next class, is what does it look like when you actually store the tuples in the data? So think about this. Instead of having a table heap with my tuples and then a B plus tree that stores my, my primary key, and so and therefore I have to keep them in sync, what if just they were just merged together and the, the leaf nodes was actually the, the tables that I, the, the tuples you know, corresponding to our primary key. So now when I want to do a traversal to find a particular key or particular tuple, instead of having to do, in the first case, I traverse the index, get a record ID, then do a lookup in the page table and find that, and then go scan inside that, that block to find the tuple that I want. What if as I do the traversal, when I land in the leaf node, there's already the data that I want? So MySQL and SQLite are probably the most two famous ones that do this. In cases like Oracle and SQL Server, I think by default you get the one at the top, but you can tell it to do this at the bottom. Like you have to pass in special flags. So now I want to distinguish, since we understand the basics of a B plus tree, let's distinguish it from the original B tree. So the major difference is that in the original B tree, the values of the of, of, of stored in the index could be anywhere in the tree, meaning any inner node could also have a value to like a record ID or the actual tuple themselves. In the B plus tree, the values are only in the leaf nodes. So what are the implications of this? Well, one, in the B tree case, I don't have any duplicate keys because I can guarantee that each key will only appear once in my, in my, uh, in my tree. In the B plus tree, because I have all those guideposts up above in the inner nodes, I'm basically duplicating keys. Furthermore, if, if I delete a key in a B plus tree, I would remove it from the, leaf, from the leaf node, but I may not actually remove it from the inner nodes, depending whether, whether I rebalance or not. Right? There, it, I may not have a path going down to it. Or, sorry, if I delete it from the leaf node, I may keep it in the inner node, because that's the, how I figure out what path to go down if I'm looking for other keys. So a B tree is going to be more economical in how, how much storage space it, it occupies because it's not duplicating keys. But the downside is going to be, and this is why that nobody ended end up actually using this in a real system, is that it makes doing updates more expensive when you have multiple threads. Because now you could be moving things up and down, right? The tree, you know, my, my, I have an inner node, I modify something, and I may need to propagate a change below me and above me. And therefore, I have to take latches on both directions, and that causes, as we'll see next class or next, next week, that can cause a lot of issues. In a B plus tree, I only make changes to the leaf nodes. I may have to propagate changes up above, but I only go in one direction. Yes? Could you repeat what you said about duplicates in the B plus tree? Yeah. So her question is, can I re repeat what I said about duplicates in a B plus tree? So going back to, to this guy here. So th this is a B plus tree. So the keys that I have that I'm trying to index are 1, 3, 6, 7, 9, 13. But if you look in the, in the, the root node, I have a 5. 5 does not appear anywhere in, in the leaf node, meaning it probably got, in, in, in this case here, it had gotten inserted, and then it got deleted. But I didn't reshuffle, reorganize my, my tree, so I left it in, in, in the inner node. In a B tree, that'll never happen. Each key only appears once. And any, if it appears in the tree, then it appears in our key set. Does that make sense? So you're leaving it there for like a certain purpose, but it's still like stored in the inner node? The question or statement is, we leave it in here for searching purposes, and, and it's still stored physically in our, in our nodes. But if I, ask, if I ask this tree, do you have key 5? I would say no, because I always have to go to the leaf node. Then I try to find 5, and I'm not going to find it. So it'll still be there, but it's, it's not actually a real key. Yes? How do we deal with like inserts here if like we fill up one of the leaves? Okay, so the question is, how do we deal with inserts when, when we fill up one of the leaves? We'll get that in a second. Yes, that's, that's the next topic. There, yeah. there won't be any uh, duplicates in, in the leaf nodes? His question is, will there not be any duplicates in the leaf nodes? Yes and no. So we'll see this in a second. So, you, so this, this would be considered a unique 
index, a unique tree for the unique keys, you can have keys that have non-unique values. And we have to handle that. We'll get to that in a sec as well. Okay. So I think the next topic is what he was what he asked is how do we actually how do we actually uh, modify this? Absolutely, yes. Inserts. Okay. So the way we're gonna do an insert is that we wanna find the we wanna traverse down and figure out what leaf node we want to insert our new key into. So again, we use those guideposts on the inner nodes to decide whether we go left or right, depending on what, whether a key is less than or greater than, what's stored in those, those key arrays. And then as we traverse down, eventually we will get to a leaf node. And then the leaf node uh, is where we want to start a key. And so if the leaf node has space, then we just insert it in. For keeping the keys in sorted order, maybe we, 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 we sort them. But there's enough space, we just insert it. If there's not enough space, then we have to split the node. We have to split the leaf node we, would, we just inserted into. And so the way we're going to do this is we're just going to take a halfway point in our key space, put all the keys that are less than the halfway point in one, one node, all the keys that were above that in another node, and then we update our parent node to now include the, that middle key, and then we have an additional pointer to our, the new node we just added. And now maybe happen to say, all right, well, this is, this is actually a recursive thing because if now my parent, as I try to insert the new key into the parent, if it doesn't have enough space, then we have to split it and then propagate the changes up above. So for one insert, we may have to reorganize the, in the entire tree. And this is what I was saying before, like, like just like in the hash table, if I insert into an index or through the hash table and then nothing's there, it's really fast. But if I had to scan a long, long time to find the slot I can go into, that can be more expensive. So sometimes we would insert into our tree and it's going to be an expensive operation because we're reorganizing the entire data structure. And other times it'll be super fast and we don't have to worry about it. All right, so let's do a uh, let's do a demo of this. So this is using uh, this is a um, you know, rather than me doing animations in PowerPoint. This is from a, uh, a professor at University of San Francisco that has a uh, a nice you know little web based visualization we can use to. Uh, In theory, yes. Okay. Right now, out of type remotely. All right. So we'll do a max degree of of three. So that means that the the max number of nodes we can have is two. Or sorry, keys in our each node is two, and it can have at most three paths going down. So we insert. Can everyone see that? You insert two. Uh, there's a visualization. Mm. Question. Yes. Question. Repeat again for the degree part. So the degree says the number of paths coming out of it. Yeah. So, so degree of three means I have, I have most three paths coming out of me if I'm an inner node. Yeah. And therefore I have to store, I can store at most two keys. Because uh, again, so go, I mean, going back to what we the showed in the very beginning, um, I mean, question, why did I set it to three, or why is it that way? Why they're only going um, two keys? So again, so this, this, so this is, so this is a, a um, this has a degree of four. So it's always, the, the number of passes is the number of keys plus one. So I can store one, two, three keys, and this guy has to have a, a, a right pointer and a, and a left pointer, right? And he has to have a right pointer, but that's shared, and there's the one at the end. So there's, there's four paths coming out for three keys. Okay. All right. So, is there a way to make this look better? Well, let's just keep going. And see how it goes. So it's it's down over there. So I've only inserted. Uh, let me get to the demo. I've only inserted two keys, or one. Sorry, one key. So right now it only has one one entry in it. So now I'll insert. I have a mouse. We insert six. Right, so again, it just it, it had space in that node, so it was able to insert it, and now I insert four, and at this point it has to split because it can only it can only store uh, it can only store two keys, so it split in half, put two over here, four and six six in its own node, and then it took the middle key four and moved it up as the new root, and again I have pointers going down to, to both of them, so now I'll do it insert in five. Right, that can fit over there, accommodate just fine. 
So now, now I insert 5. What should happen? Right? It'll say, well, 5 is greater than 4. Uh, it's greater than equal to 4, so I know I need to go down this direction. But I can only sort, uh, I can only, I can only uh, store two keys in this node, so I'm not going to have to split this guys and then rebalance everything. So hit enter, right? Four goes down there, puts five there, right? It split the split the node, put four in the middle over here, five and six over here, and then put five up because that was the middle key. And now we have pointers uh, going to this node, the middle node here with four, and that one five, right? So again, this is recursive. As I keep adding, inserting more stuff, and I keep splitting, I keep splitting the changes up. Yes? So what if we have duplicate keys? So he says, what if we have duplicate keys? So actually, I don't, don't know whether this will matter. So I should insert four. But two fours. Yeah, it did that. Um, so there's different ways. To, sorry, I kind of like, it's the, it's the resolution that is jacked. Um, F11, no. How did I do that? Shit, sorry. There we go. Okay, sorry. So this is just sort of a toy diagram. In 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 a real system, you could store four together and just maintain uh, multiple entries for for all the unique values of that that you had the same key. Yeah. In in this case, I mean, the worst case could not be logged in anymore because if we have all the I mean, all the keys to be four, then the search could be login. Uh, could be O N. So, okay, your statement is if all my keys are the same, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's four, 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 four. Then, if I'm looking for an exact key value pair, then it's lo it's N because I do a sequential scan. Yes. So, you know, we can pop up Postgres. We can make a table that has a billion rows, and for one column, we set the value to one, and we can call create. You know, every so every well, every one billion row has the same value for that one column, and Postgres will let us build an index on that, on that in, uh, on that column. It's a stupid index to build because, as you said, they're all the same. So, in, but it, so in, so how do I say this? People will do stupid things in general. Don't be stupid and don't build indexes on things that you shouldn't use. Right? There's other types of indexes we'll see. So a hash table, there's other things like inverted indexes we could use that could be better if you had a lot of duplicate values. But think of like email addresses or think of like uh, phone numbers or things that were like, it's going to be vastly uh, diverse, then we won't really have that problem. Or a primary key, right? Primary key has to be unique. That would be great for this. All right, so again, so this, is this clear? Okay, so let's go back. So the do deletes now. We have the opposite problem. Again, inserts, if we got too full, we run out of space and we have to do that split. If we delete, then it may be the case we end up being less than half full, which would violate the guarantees we have to have in our B plus tree. And then therefore we have to do the opposite of a split, which is a merge. So delete something. Again, I just do my traversal. I go down the tree, try to find the, uh, the key that I want to delete. I land, I'm always going to land in a leaf node. If my leaf node, after deleting that key, is still at least half full, then I'm done. I just remove it, maybe reorganize my, my sorted key arrays, but then that's it. But if I'm less than half full, then now I have to, to, to figure out how to get rebalanced. So the sort of one easy trick we could do is look at our siblings uh, in other leaf nodes, and that's why we have those sibling pointers. We can look at them and try to steal one of their keys to make ourselves balanced, right? Long as long as the, our sibling has the same parent as us, then it's okay for us to steal this because that doesn't require any re, re, rebalancing up above. So, if we're not able to steal from our sibling, then we have to merge. So then we got to go take our take take one of our siblings, combine all our keys together. That may actually end up being uh, uh, too full as well. But then we, we could we could. Split thing that split that as well as well. Oh, that's the same thing as just copying this. But we would merge, delete it, delete a key up above, and then now where everything's balanced again. Again, just like in splits, where like I may have to go propagate the change everywhere. When we merge and we're deleting keys, the, the, our parent now be, may become less than half full, and it has to merge. And that for we have to re maybe restructure the entire tree. All right, so let's go back and and to our example here, and do our demo. 
And of course, now I've got to figure out how to get to the top right corner. So we just maintain the siblings in, uh, in the leaf nodes only? Correct. His question is, do we maintain the siblings only in the leaf nodes? Yes. All right, so let's do, let's do delete four. Right, let's start with delete five. Let me scroll down and then hit enter so we can see this. Okay. Right, so it does a traversal. Oh, that was insert. Shit, sorry. Delete five. Yeah, that's insert. That's delete. Again, sorry for the low resolution. All right, so let's delete five. In this case here, it should find both of them. I guess I only found one of them. So let's delete the other one. Goes down. That's fine. Again, at this point here, both these nodes are still more than half full. So that's fine. So now let's delete four, and I suspect it will try to delete the, the one that's farther on that side. Go down, right, found that, deletes that. Again, that node is now ha half empty. Uh, I mean, and, and it has to have at least one. Uh, and because it was empty, it, re it, it merged everything and, and, and decreased the height of the tree. Yes? His question is, if only the leaf nodes have sibling pointers, then how do you actually do this merge? So the way it works, basically, think of, the, think of a thread going down. It can maintain a stack of what nodes it visited as it goes down. And we're actually going to need to do this when we do what's called latch crabbing or, or coupling. As we go down, we take latches to, in case we need to reorganize everything. And so I have to know what, I have to hold latches up, you know, at, when I go down somewhere, I have to hold the latch my parent in case I need to reorganize whatever I'm doing down below so I don't release it until I know I'm safe. So I know how I got there. Yes? And there are two siblings, so if there are two siblings to the left and to the right, so which yeah. one can you choose? His question is, if there's two siblings to the left or the right, which one do you choose? It depends. Right? You, typically, you choose the one that has the same parent as you. Actually, I think you have to, actually. But if, you're, like, if, if you were in the middle... Yeah, these guys have the same parent. So you say you want to reorganize this. You could choose either left or right. It doesn't matter. Let's see what this one does. So, we, so we, if we delete four, that should take it out of the middle. And then now I delete two, and it's going to pick either left or right. Okay. It, 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 actually, it, it only has, it can only have one or two or one or two. So it went empty, and that literally did it. We can, we can increase the degree of the tree, but like, it doesn't matter. It'd still be correct. And so this one also, this, this diagram shows the, the sibling pointers going in one way. You can have it go in both directions. You have to do extra work to make that happen, but like you can do that. A lot of times, again, for simplicity, you could just have it go in one direction, but then you can't do you know, order by in descending order and go the other direction if you want to do scans. Right? Pretty straightforward. Of course, getting the, the details of the deletes and inserts doing that split and merge is actually very difficult in practice. And we'll see in next week how to actually make sure, make sure that when we're, when we're reorganizing the tree that we're thread safe we, and we don't have any uh, integrity issues. All right, so the, in practice, the, the, in, in, in the research shows that the typical fill factor for a real tree on real data is about 67 to 69%, meaning the, the, the amount of data storing in your nodes that's actually real is up to you know 67% of is actually use, useful data. So typical capacities you, you can have, uh, you know, when when uh, for the eight kilobyte pages, with a uh, this number of pages are just at four levels, you can basically store 300,000 key value pairs, right? So you can index and get in log n time to any one of three 300, 300 million uh, keys. Very, very quickly. And most of the data is, is again, going to be stored on the leaf pages, as you would expect, right? Because as you add more keys, you start to fan out, and most of the data is going to be stored in, the, uh, in those leaf nodes. All right, so let's talk about some other things you can do with, 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 uh, with these indexes. So there is this concept and this notion of, of what are called clustered indexes. And so I said in the beginning that the table heap for a database is unordered, meaning we can insert 
tuples into any page in any order. We don't have to follow the, you know, the temporal order of how things got inserted. But there may be some times where we actually want to have the data sorted in a certain way. Like, for example, like the primary key. So these would be called clustered indexes. So you can, you can define an index when you, when you create a table. You can define a what's called a clustered index, and the data system will guarantee that the, the physical layout of tuples on pages will match the order that, that, that they're sorted in the, in the index. So this is useful for certain things like, you know, if, if I'm doing a lot of lookups within exact ranges of the primary key, if I know my tuples are stored on that in the same order that primary key, now when I, when I you know, traverse to the leaf node, within a small number of pages, I can find all the data that I, that I need. If I'm not sorted on, my, on the key I'm doing my lookup on, then every single record ID I could have could point to another page, and I could be doing a bunch of different random IOs to go read the data that I want. So not all database systems support this. Uh, some data systems, you get this by default, like MySQL, by storing the, the tuples in the, the leaf nodes themselves. It's, it is a clustered index. So it's guaranteed to have on the pages on disk, the tuples are sorted in the primary key order. In the case of MySQL, if you don't define a primary key, they'll make one for you. Right? They'll have a synthetic like row ID or record ID that's transparent to you, but that's how they use to, to figure out you know, what, where your tuple is actually located. In case of Postgres, uh, we can do a demo next time. But they have clustered indexes. You can define one. You can say, cluster my table on this index, but it won't actually maintain it in that order. Meaning it does the sorting once, stores it on disk, but then over time it can get out of order because it won't do it for you automatically. And when we talk about multi-version concurrent control, it'll become very clear why this is the case for them. So let's talk about how, how we can do some lookups on, on, the, uh, on, our, on our B plus tree. So again, because things are in sorted of order, uh, you know, we, we can do fast traversal to find the thing we're looking for. But we may, what, one advantage you can do with a B plus tree that you can't do with a hash table is that you don't need to have ex the exact key in order to do a lookup. You can have actually some part of the key. So let's say a real simple, simple example, I have an index on attribute ABC. So I can do lookups like this, where A equals 5 and B equals 3, where I, have, I don't have the C, but I have A and B. And I don't need to have the C, and I can still find the things that I'm looking for. You can't do that in a hash index because think of what would happen. I would take this 5 and 3, try to hash them together without the C, and that's going to jump to some random location that's not, that's not what I'm looking for. You can also do queries where you only have maybe the, the middle guy. right? You don't have the prefix, you don't have the suffix, you just have the middle, the middle key. Again, you can't do that in a hash table. So not all databases support this. Pretty much everyone supports the prefix one where you have at least the keys uh, in, in the order as they're defined for the index. Not everyone can do this middle one here. Actually, actually I think maybe only Oracle and SQL Server can do this. So let's look at a little more concrete example. So let's say we have an index that, that is defined on two, two, uh, two columns or two attributes. So this would be called like a composite key. So instead of being on for one column, it's actually two, two columns combined. And the order of how we define our index uh, will determine what kind of queries we can do on them. So again, if I'm trying to do a lookup on A, uh, say, to trying to find key AB, well, in that case, I have both attributes that I've defined in my key. So now I can just do a straight comparison of look at the first key and then look at the second key and then determine whether I want to go left and right. So in this case here, A is less than or equal to A and B is less than or equal to C. So I know I, to find the key that I'm looking for, I go down this path, do whatever search I want to do in my node, and then I can find the entry that I want. Let's say, though, now I want to do a prefix search where I only have the first element of my composite key, but not the second one. So again, I can just look at the first key, or first attribute of the key. A is less than or equal to A, so I know that the starting point for what I'm looking for has to be down in this direction, so I go down here. But now I'm going to do a, a sequential scan across my node and going across the, the, the leaves to find all the entry I want up until I reach a key that is less than or equal to the, you know, my key A. So in this case, as soon as I find one that starts with B, I know my search is done, and there's not going to be anything else remaining in the leaf nodes that would satisfy my predicate. So this one, again, this one's pretty easy, or not easy, but a lot of data systems can support this one. The hard one is this, where you only have, uh, you only have the last element and not the first one. So the way you actually end up implementing this is you try to figure out, at least in the, in the top, in the, in the root node, which 
which portions of the tree do I need to look at? It could be something you know, that there's something could be there. So in this case here, I know that uh, no matter what I have for the first value, it's always going to have to be less than C for the second attribute, the, the second value. So I don't need to look at this guy over here. I only need to look at these other ones. So essentially what you just do is you end up doing multiple index probes or multiple traversals and substituting different values for the thing that you don't have. So we look at the top and say, well, I know I have an A, I have a B, and I have a C. Well, there's nothing for this C that I would find over here, so I can skip that. So let me now do a lookup in these guys, and I substitute the star with an A. And each one of those is a separate lookup. And then you combine them all together and produce the final result. So Oracle calls this skip scans. I don't know what other systems call them. Yes? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, you're right. That's wrong. But the, yes, so you would include that, but it's each one of those it was a separate traversal, okay. and, and you're just filling in the values. Okay. Whereas, like in this one here, the main point I'm trying to make is like this one, like for this one and the first one, I had to do one traversal, and then I found the thing I was looking for. This one is you have to probe down multiple times, and you fill in the values. Thank you. I'll fix that. Okay. So let's get to the good stuff. So we know what a B plus tree is now. Let's talk about actually how you want to build it and make this thing actually useful. So there's this great book, uh, which I think is free. At least if you Google it, it shows up free. I don't know whether that's true or not. Uh, there's this great book written a few years ago by Gertz Graffy, uh, who's a famous database researcher. He's going to talk, we'll talk about a lot of the stuff he's done for query optimization later on. But he basically, he wrote this book as like all the modern techniques and, and tweaks and optimizations you can do in, in, a, in a B plus tree in, in, in a real system. So we're going to cover some of, some of these things. And actually, it's a really light read, and well, it was. And like, it covers all the really uh, important topics in, in a way that's easy to read. So we're talking about how to handle different node sizes, how to do merging, how to handle variable length keys, the non-unique keys, what they asked about, and then inter-node search, how to do better searches inside the node. So in general, the the you can think of a node in our B plus tree is just a, like a page in our table, right? So the size of the node could be the same as a page size. In practice, though, it doesn't have to be. And depending on what kind of hardware we're storing our database on, we actually may want to have even larger page sizes or smaller page, uh, node sizes or smaller node sizes. So it turns out the research shows that the slower the disk you have, that you're just storing your index on, your tree on, the larger the node size you want. And, you know, it should be obvious, right? You, the, for every disk I/O I do, I'm bringing, I can read the, the, the node sequentially, all the pages for it, and that's going to be much faster than do a bunch of random I/O to different different nodes if my node is is a smaller size. So if you're on a spinning disk hard drive, you can have node sizes up to one megabyte. That's usually a, a good number. SSD is roughly 10 kilobytes, which roughly corresponds to the the node sizes or page sizes that real database systems use. But then if you're an in-memory database, you actually want to go low as 512 bytes. And so the, this is another good example where we talked about how in our buffer pool, we could have one buffer pool in our system for index pages and one buffer pool set for, for data pages, and we could set them to be different sizes. So I could set, if I'm on a sp slow spinning disk hard drive, I could have a buffer pool for my B plus G pages and have them be uh, one megabyte, whereas my data pages, I'll keep them at 8 kilobytes or 16 kilobytes. The optimal size can also vary depending on what kind of operations or queries you're doing on it. So leaf node scans where you're doing uh, long sequential reads, those are typically better to have larger node sizes because I can do more sequential I.O. Whereas if I'm doing a lot of lookups, a lot of traversal, that's a lot of random I.O. So therefore I want to have uh, smaller node sizes. So the next thing we can do is actually violate the very thing I said in the beginning about how the we always have to merge any time the Anytime we're less than half full. And in the demo I did, it was sort of simple. It, it, it would do, it'd do exactly that. But in practice, you may actually not want to do this immediately when you're less than half full. Because it's just like when we saw on the hash table when we did deletes with linear, linear hashing at the end, I may compact something, I may merge something uh, because I went less than half full. But then the very next operation inserts into that node, and now I have to just split all over again. So the, the merging operation is, is expensive. 
Splits are, uh, uh, splits are also expensive, but splits we have to do because we ran out of space in our node. But the merge is we actually relax that, that requirement and not merge things right away. So it gets slightly unbalanced over time. And then in the background, we can have like a garbage collector or something go through and do rebalancing. Or what's oftentimes the case, people just rebuild the entire tree from scratch, and that fixes all these issues. So the, a lot of times you see this in you know, high-end commercial enterprise systems. You know, they'll, they'll, they'll shut the database down over the weekend because they're going to rebuild all their indexes. And that's essentially what they're doing. They're, they're rebalancing everything because it wasn't always merging correctly. Um, anytime you see like a bank says they're down at 3 a.m. On, on a Sunday in the morning, it's probably, and this is one of the things they're probably doing. All right, so now we want to talk about how we actually want to handle uh, variable length keys. So again, everything I've shown so far, we assume that the key is a fixed length and the value is always fixed length. And in practice, the values will always be fixed length. So there's four different ways we can handle this. So the first approach is that rather than storing the key itself in, in the node, we just store a pointer to the actual attribute or the tuple where we can do a lookup to find what the key actually, actually is. So again, if I, have a, you know, if I have an attribute that's a, a, ver a variable length uh, varchar, instead of storing that varchar in the, in the, the node, I have its record ID. And then, then when, I when I want to figure out whether the key I'm doing a lookup on matches that key that's stored in, in that B tree, I follow the record ID, go get the page, and go look at the, what the real value actually is. So this is obviously super slow. Uh, it's nice because it, we're storing less data because now we just store the pointer instead of the actual key in the, in the, in the, in the node. But it's expensive to do that lookup you know, as we're traversing. People tried this in the 1980s for in-memory databases because memory was really expensive, but nobody actually does this anymore. Everybody stores the keys always whole in the, in the node. The next you can do have variable length nodes. This is basically allows the, the, the size of a node can vary based on what's stored in it. Um, but we said this is a bad idea because we want our page sizes to be always the same in our buffer pool and on disk. So we don't have to worry about doing the bin backing problem to decide how to you know, put you know, find free space to put in what we want to store. So nobody does this one as well. The next approach is to do padding, where basically we say, we look at what the attribute is that you're trying to index on, and we say that whatever the max size it could be, no matter what key you give us, we will pad it out with either null bits or uh, you know, zeros to make it always fit exactly our, our node size. So everything is always nice, nicely aligned. So some systems actually actually do this. Uh, I think Postgres does this, and we can look at that next time. Um, but again, you're, you're, it, it, it's, it's a trade-off. I'm wasting space in order to store things. So this why is also, too, it's super important to make sure that you define your schema correctly. Like if I'm storing email addresses, which are you know, maybe 32 characters or 50 characters, but I set the varchar size to be 1024, if I'm padding it out up to 1024, even though most of my emails aren't that big, then I'm wasting a lot of space. Yes? What do you do if like you're just keeping strings in general here because you have no, you just define the maximum size of strings always but, like it's just defined in the schema as opposed to like so for that sorry I mean, say it again sorry just in general right? because like these aren't like necessarily like C strings where they have to L and null terminator be, like, correct terminator, like, you always define the length yeah so like when you call create table you can define varchar and you, you define the length in it you don't have to put it in I and I, I don't different systems default to different things but in practice you always want to say this is the max size of what I actually can store. Right? And then, so varchar is supposed to be variable length. So even though, say, the max size can be 32, uh, if you give it a 16, 16 you know, character string, it could, in theory, store that more compactly. S some systems do different things. I, some systems actually, if you say it's, it's a char, and where it's always going to be that size, and it's always padded out, they actually just still store that as a varchar. So logically, you don't know, you don't care. Uh, underneath the covers, they can do different things. And my SQL was always the worst offender. So, so if you say the max size of a string is like 16, and you give it a 32-character string, it'll store it. It just truncates it silently for you. Right? So Postgres and other systems will throw an error, but the data systems, database system should enforce that correctly. And same thing for an index. We, like, to build an index, we have to be told, you know, here's the, here's the attributes in our tables you're, you're indexing, so we know what their type is, we know what their max size is, and we can pad out and, as, as needed. All right, what's probably more common is, is to use uh, an in indirection map where we'll store pointers for our keys inside of our sort of key array, but we're still, the pointers are just actually two offsets in our, in our node themselves 
rather than to some arbitrary page. So it would look like this. So we have a the sort of key map. So again, this is sorted. These are just pointers or offsets to down here, but these are sorted based on the values of the keys. So to be very clear, the keys themselves, not the keys corresponding value, but the actual string that we're trying to store. Right? And so just like in the slotted page uh, layout for tuples, we're going to grow from, from the end to the beginning, and this side grows from the uh, you know, from, from beginning to the end. And at some point, we get to full. Actually, I think this has to be fixed size, because we have to set a degree ahead of time. So, but if I, if I don't run out of space for what I'm trying to store here, then I can have an overflow page uh, that's, that's chained to this. So again, this is just, a, just a, an offset to whatever the key is. So now if I'm doing binary search, as I'm jumping around this array, I jump down here to see what the actual key value is. So what's a really simple optimization we could do to make this go faster? In the back. It's, his, his statement is, is it a statement or a question? Do we store this as a, an array or a linked list? It's always stored as an array. Okay, so his statement is, I'm storing this as an array or a vector. A vector is just a wrapper or an array. If I now do insertion or deletion, that's going to take O, N. Or, yes. But, again, like this is... This is just within the node itself. So the size is not that big, right? So, you know, uh, fan out of like maybe 32. So I have 32 elements I need, I need to keep sorted. I, I can do that in cache. That's very fast. So, so like uh, when you are moving down, always you compare, like you, when, when you have to compare with different keys, you like compare that key first going to the pointer place and then compare. Correct. Yeah, so, so say I'm doing binary search. So in this case, binary search is just, you, actually, just do, just do linear search. So I just follow, scan along and I want to see, is, does the key I'm looking for match what, what, what I have? So I have to follow this pointer, which again, it's just an offset. It's in the same page. So it's going to be you know, maybe 16 bits. I follow that offset to jump to where this is, and then I do my, my comparison. And if it doesn't match, then I jump back and do the same and jump down here. And so just like in slotted pages, where the tuples don't have to be sorted in the order uh, you know, as they're laid out in the page, in the same way they're sorted at the slot array, this variable length data at the down here can be in any order that it wants. I just know how to, you know, I, I know how to jump to it based on this. So for non-leaf nodes also, we do the same thing. His question is, for non-leaf nodes, do you do the same thing? Yes. It's in. This is for very well linked data and, and any node. So this is this is sort of a micro optimization. And going to disk is always the most expensive thing, but a really simple thing we could do is just recognize that before, since this is only sixteen bits in general, I have a lot of space up here. So maybe I just take the first character of every string and just embed it inside up here. So now when I'm, when I'm scanning along and trying to find the thing I'm looking for, if the, my key doesn't match exactly you know, the first character, then I know I, I don't need to traverse down and find it. So again, this is, like, this is, this is all going to be in memory. This is like avoiding cache misses um, in making the binary search and making the search on this one faster. So again, this is a micro-optimization. Avoiding disk is always the major thing that we care about in this course, but this is a really simple trick you can do to speed this up. Yes? What if there are two persons? Whose names start with the same letter. Again, so it's like, what if there's two persons that names start the same letter? Again, you'd have to, uh, depending on what you're looking for, you, uh, if you want to find exactly one, you find the first one and you're done. If you need to find anybody, you have to go to both of them. Right? I mean, same way here, right? For this one here, I'd have to, I'd have to, if I'm trying to find, uh, everyone's different here, but if there's like Paul and Prashant, who's my PhD student, I would scan down here, find Prashant, then actually go to the next one to make sure that that one doesn't have the same, you know, doesn't have the same thing as well. But this will work only if your sorting is based on the names. Like you can define sort functions also, right? Like which map the strings to certain numbers, and those are used. Okay, so his so he's talking about collations. So there's diff, So I'm showing lexicographical ordering, alphabetical ordering for this. There, in, in high-end database systems, you can actually define arbitrary sort orders. It, everything still works the same. Then what will you store there? Uh, you're, not even, you're talking about like dictionary codes. We're not only talking about that. 
you, I can have different you know, sorting based on whether it's Unicode or what, what language I'm using. For that one, you have to, again, the data system would know this is how the sort order is. So what, you know, it would know what, what prefix it, if it wants to store up in here. Again, the, the high, level, high level idea is it's still the same. Yes? Uh, I want to double check. So like, if we have k plus 1 degree, that means we have at most k keys. Correct. And then when we want to explore something, so he repeat what he said. So he said, if you have k keys, you have at most k plus one uh, pointers to other things. And then you explore all the k keys to find out the potential one that you want to go through. Want to Not necessarily. For, for, for simplicity, yes. You just scan along the keys and do a linear search. And then, so the, the, the time complexity should be like k times log n instead of log n. And so his statement is that the Really, the complexity should be k times log n. Yes, the that that that's a constant we can throw out because the log n is, is the, the maximum number of page IOs I have to do to traverse. That's always orders of magnitude faster than doing the, the, the cache line lookups, lookups here. Remember, I said in the very beginning, here's the storage hierarchy. Anything above memory, we don't care about. We can throw away. It's the disk IOs is is the the real killer, and we got to avoid that. When we do binary search, like we'll get to that in a second. Okay. All right. So now I'll get to the, the other thing that people asked about is how we handle non non unique indexes. Well, this is the same thing we talked about in hash tables. There's two two basic approaches. You can just duplicate the keys, uh, and be mindful. Uh, like in our example here, the, the the duplicate key split over to another to another node. We have to be mindful that 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 could occur, and and make sure we read everything we need to read, or we just store a value list. Where we store the key once and we duplicate the value, or have have a separate uh, space in our node to store all the values for that given key, right? So it looks like this. So if I if I duplicate the key, right, I just have the key multiple times, and again, it's just like before. The offset points down to wherever the value is, and you know if I insert a new one, then I you know I insert it here and insert a new K one. I just insert it here and move everything over, and everything still works. The value list essentially just looks like this. I just store the key once, but then now I also have a pointer or an offset to somewhere else in the, the node where I have all the, the, the values that correspond to that, that given key. The, the first approach is more common. I don't know who actually does this one here. Yes? So, so her question is, can I assume for that Duplicate keys will always be in the same node. No. So the, in the example I showed from that demo, it actually moved it over as a sibling key. Uh, that's one way to do it. Other systems actually would have an overflow chain that would say, for that given leaf node, oh, by the way, here's some other pages or other nodes down below you that have, that, you know, have the keys that correspond to you know, what you're actually storing up above. The question is, if I'm searching for a given key, how would I know what key to follow? So uh, going back to that, that example, I would, if I'm looking for a greater than or equal to 4, I, had a, I have to go down on, the, on this side and find the, the, the first entry point for 4. Then I keep scanning along the leaf nodes until I find something that's not equal to 4, and then I know I've, I've seen everything. Again, the data system knows whether the keys are unique or not, so it knows whether it has to do that. So it knows that oh, this is a primary key, or this is a unique index, so the thing I'm looking for should only appear once, and therefore I just get to the one leaf node that has what I want. If it's non-unique, then you have to account for that, and either, again, you, if, it's, if it's just duplicated in, in, across leaf nodes, I scan along siblings. If it's an overflow, I just find the, the first leaf node and then scan down its chain. Yes? So the size of key is not always the same. How about the values? The, state, the question is, the size, is the size of the key always the same? Or the size of the key is not always the same, or the values are always, always the same. Again, I'll, I'll show this next, next class. If the, if the value is just a record ID for a tuple, always the same. It's either 32 bits or 64 bits, depending on the system. If it's the actual tuple itself, like in MySQL, then you've got to deal with overflows that way. And that, that's more complicated. We'll, we'll discuss that next class. All right, again, we've already discussed this briefly, but I'm going to show that there's different ways to do searches within the node. Again, I traverse, as I'm traversing the nodes, traversing the tree, 
I have to do a search on the key, the key array to find anything that I'm you know, looking for to decide whether you know, there's a match that I want or whether I need to go left or right. So the most basic way to do this is just a linear search. So if I'm trying to find key 8, I just start at the beginning of my sort of key array, scan along until I find what I want, and I'm done. Right? Worst case scenario, I have to look at all k keys. Binary search, if it's sorted, then I just find the middle point, jump to that, figure out is that less than or less than or greater than the key I'm looking for or the one I am looking for, and that tells me whether I go to left or right. In this case here, I'm looking for 8. I land on 7. I know 8 is greater than 7, so I can jump over here. Then I take the halfway point of that. I get 9. Then I go, go, go to this direction, and I get 8, and I find what I want. One thing, though, that is kind of cool you can do, if you know what the values actually look like for your keys, or actually what the keys look like, is that you can use an interpolation technique where you can approximate the, the location of the key by doing some simple math to figure out what your starting point should be for your linear search. So rather than in case of linear search, you start from the beginning and go all the way to the end. If I know that my keys are, in this case, integers, and I know something about their distribution, then I can do a really simple, you know, simple math and say, well, I know I have seven keys in my array, and the max key is 10, and I'm looking for 8. So if I take 10 minus 8 and get 2, and then 7 keys minus, minus 2 and get 5, I know I can just jump to the fifth position, and that's at least a starting point for what I'm looking for. So this one, this, this obviously works because they're always increasing in Montanic order, right? If there are floats, this is harder to do. If there are strings, I don't think you can do this. But this is another technique you could do to make the, that, that search go faster. This one, I don't know how, is com how common it is. The binary search is, I think, what everyone does. But again, there's this trade-off now. In order to make binary search, I have to make sure my keys are in sorted order. If I'm doing the linear search, I don't have to do that. So therefore, as I update the nodes, I don't pay that penalty of maintaining the, the sort order. All right, so let's finish up uh, real quickly. Talk about some optimizations we can do to make, to make the, it go better. So these are the kind of things that, like, again, a, a real database system would actually do to, to make uh, B plus trees go faster. So the first type, first two things we're talking about are different ways to compress the data. So the first kind of compression scheme we can do is called prefix compression. And this is based on the observation that because we're keeping the keys in sorted order, it's very likely in a lot of data sets, the keys that are stored in a, in a single node are actually going to be very similar to each other. Right? Because that's because we end up sorting them, right? So in this case here, I have a node that has three keys, Rob, Robbing, and Robot. Well, all three of them share the same prefix, ROB. And so rather than me duplicating or storing that redundant ROB over, for, over and over again for every single key, what if I extract that out, just store the prefix once ROB, and then for the, for the, the keys, I just store the remaining parts of, that's actually different. So this is very, very common. This is, this, these are called sometimes prefix compression, prefix trees. This is, um, this is why you use in a, uh, a lot of high-end or a lot of large data, database systems because, you know, because there's so much duplicate data. So Facebook uses this for, for all their internal MySQL stuff, and it makes a big difference for them. And they save a lot of space. So this is just sort of one way to do this. There's other optimizations you can do. Like, if again, if I'm doing a clustered index where I know all my tuples, the tuples are on, on disk or on pages in the same way that they're sorted in my index, then it's very likely that tuples in the same node, their record ID will have the same page ID because they're all going to land on the same page. So rather than storing that page ID over and over again for every single, for every single tuple in a, in a node, I just store the page ID once and then store their offset or slot separately. Right? Yes? Um, so, I'm sorry, if, I mean, if, you're, if you're doing something like this, then, um, then, then, how, then how does the system choose what prefix to use? Because, for example, here you have two things that start with ROBB. How does, I know in this case it's like three things, so it's kind of obvious. So yes. The question is, how do we actually decide what to do? Right? So, you basically can say every single time I insert, I figure out what the common prefix is, and that's what I'll store. Uh, you could say anytime I do like a compaction or do like a reoptimization, uh, then I decide what the best is thing for right that you know for the uh, for my keys right then and there. In practice, also think of it like in a lot of database systems, um, the the newer keys might get inserted in always on the one side of the tree, like it's always increasing in value, and so therefore the uh, a lot a large portion of the tree on the other side is going to be static. 
it's going to be you know mostly read only. So at that point, I can make it a hard decision. Like here's how I want to do uh, compression and compaction. Different trade-offs. You either can do it online or offline. Yes. How do you deal with like if someone inserts like what is it, like, it's like the word sad or something like that? Right? So the question is, what happens if someone inserts the word sad? Right, and it ends up in this node. Then yeah, you have to you have to account for that. You have to maintain it on on on, on the fly. You have to remove the prefix or something. Correct. Yeah. Or you could say you can source mesh additional metadata. Say this prefix is only used for the first three keys, not the other ones. All right. There's a bunch of different tricks you can do. So the the opposite of prefix compression is suffix tr truncation, and the ba the basic idea here is that we can recognize that we don't maybe need to store the entire key in our inner nodes uh, to to figure out whether we want to go left and right. So in this case here, we have ABCD up to K for one key, and LMNO up to V for another key. But if I'm just trying to see whether I want to go left or right, I can probably get by just looking at the first, you know, in this case here, first character. So instead of storing the entire key in the inner node, I'll just store a, a, a uniquely distinguishing uh, prefix of it and then throw away the, the remaining suffix. So in this case here, I could have just stored L and A and L, and that would have been enough, but I'm showing ABC, LMNN. Right? And again, down below, I still have to store the entire key because I need to go be able to have that and be able to say, you know, is the key I'm looking for here? But in my, in my inner guidepost, I don't need to have this, uh, have the full key. And of course, again, you have to maintain this. If something, somebody inserts something that would, would violate these, this, we have to, you know, reorder it or re reorganize it. But in practice, you know, if, if, if the data is, is not changing a lot, then this could be another big win. So as far as I know, prefix compression is more, uh, more common than the suffix truncation. All right, the last two things I want to talk about is how to handle bulk inserts and uh, pointer swizzling. So in all the examples I showed so far, we assume that we're incrementally building out our, our index. We're in, in inserting keys one by one. But in a lot of cases, you have all the keys ahead of time. So it's a very common pattern that people do in databases is that, say I want to bulk load a new data set you know, I collected data from some other source, and I want to put it into to my database. A lot of times what people do is they turn off all indexes, bulk load the data, insert it into the table, and then they go back and add the indexes. Right? So that way, you, as, you, as you're inserting the new data, you're not trying to maintain the index, which, which is expensive. So in this case here, if you have all the keys ahead of time, a really simple optimization to do to build the index is rather than building it top down like we've done so far, you actually build it from the bottom up. So let's say these are the keys I want to insert. The very first thing I do is just sort them. And we'll see in, in a few weeks, we, there's an efficient algorithm we can use to, that can sort data uh, in, in such a way that maximizes, maximizes the amount of sequential I.O. we have to do. So we can sort it, and that, that's going to be way more efficient than actually building the index uh, one by one. And then we just lay it out along leaf nodes, have everything filled out correctly, and then going from the bottom to the top, we just fill in the, the inner, inner nodes and, and generate our pointers. So again, this is, this is a pretty standard technique that any major data system will, will be able to support when you call create index on a large data set that already exists. And then once it's already built, once it's built, then I can you know, maintain it or do any ch changes I want just like before. There's no, no real difference to it. The data system doesn't know whether you did the bulk insert versus the, the incremental build to build the index. Everything's still the same. In the back, yes. Uh, so what if we want to move the small key up to the large P plus tree? So this question is, what happens if you want to merge a small P plus tree into a large P plus tree? Let's take that offline, and we have a paper that does something like this. But I would say, in general, building indexes, very, building indexes uh, with bulk inserts very fast is a very, very hard problem. Uh, and it's, at least in academia, it's underappreciated. This is very, very common. So having your data system do this as fast as possible is super important. So let's talk about that afterwards. All right, the last thing I want to talk about is called pointer swizzling. So again, I, I talked about how w the way we figure out how to traverse the index is by having these pointers from one node to the next. In actuality, what we're storing is not you know, raw memory pointers. We're storing page IDs. And whenever we want to do traversal, let's say we want to find key greater than three, we start here and we say, oh, I want to go to this, this node down here. Well, how do we actually get there? Well, in the, in the root node, I'm storing a page ID for this index. And now I've got to go down to the buffer pool and say, hey, I have page two. If it's in memory, if it's not in memory, go get it for me and, and then give me back a pointer to it. So then I, I go get now my pointer to it, and now I can do my traversal. 
Same thing as I'm scanning along here, I want to get to my sibling. I, this is, you know, my sibling is page three, because that's what's stored in my, my, my node. I got to go down to the buffer pool and say, give me the pointer for page three. So as I'm traversing, I keep going back to the buffer pool manager and saying, do this conversion from page ID to, 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 to pointer. And this is really expensive because I got you know, I had to protect my hash table and my, and my buffer pool with latches. And therefore, you know, I'm going through a bunch of steps just to get this pointer. So with pointer swizzling, the idea is that if I know all my pages are pinned in memory, meaning I, I know that it's not going to be going to be evicted, well, instead of storing the the page ID, I'll just replace it with the page pointer. Because I know if it's pinned, it's never going to move to a different memory address. So now when I do traversals, instead of doing that look up to the buffer pool, I have exactly the page ID, or page, the page pointer that I want, and I can go get exactly the data that I want. And I don't have to go ask the, the buffer pool. Of course, now I've got to make sure that when I, if I evict this thing, I write it out the disk, I don't store the page pointer, because when it comes back in, that's going to be completely different. So you don't blow away the page ID entirely. It's just you have a little extra metadata to say, here's the pointer you really want, not the page number. So you may say, all right, when would we actually pay, when would we actually would we be pinning these pages in memory? Well, maybe not for the leaf nodes, but at least for the upper levels, the root and maybe the second level, those things are going to be super hot because I'm always going to have to go through them to get down to the leaf nodes. So maybe it's not that big of a deal for me to pin those pages, and then they're going to be relatively small compared to the size of the entire tree. And then I can use this optimization because I know my pointers are always going to be valid. So this one is actually very common. Pointer swizzling is used in, in pretty much every major system. OK? All right, so to finish up, the BB plus tree is awesome. Uh, hopefully, I've convinced you that it's a good idea to use this for your, for your, uh, for your uh, you know, if you're building a database system. Next class, we'll see some, some additional optimizations for this, uh, and we'll maybe do some demos with Postgres and MySQL. But then we'll also talk about two other types of tree-based indexes we, we may want to use. Tries or radex trees, which are going to look like B trees, but slightly different because they're not store entire keys. And then inverted indexes will allow us to do full key searches. <coughs> Any questions? Hit it. Oh dear, coming through with my shell and crew. Two cent for a case, give me St. Oz proof. In the mix of broken bottles and crushed up cans. Met the cows in the jam, oh how dry. It's with St. Ives in my system. Crack another, I'm blessed. Let's go get the next one and get over. The object is to stay sober. Lay on the sofa. Better yet, down my shoulder. Who be the be Stressed out, could never be son. Rick is a jelly, hit the deli for a cold one. Naturally blessed, yes. My rap is like a laser beam. The bullets in the bushes. St. Ives been the canteen. Crack the bottle of the St. Ives. Sip it through those who don't realize. The drinking ain't only to be drunk. You can't drive. Keep my people still alive. And if the sink don't know you from a can of paint, paint.